Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, the Oxford Union for our first debate during uh, School World Forum Week. Uh, I'm Peter Drobak, the director of the School Center for Social Entrepreneurship here in Oxford, and we're, we're thrilled to have you uh, here in the most uh, prestigious debating society in the world. Uh, the Oxford Union was founded in 1823. It's a student-led debating society and for generations has trained uh, leaders and politicians from the UK and around the world to uh, talk clever. And this hall was built in 1879, so it's uh, relatively young uh, by Oxford standards, so I apologize for that. Um, uh, but it's a wonderful place, and as you can see, looking around at some of the portraits on the walls, um, uh, many, many, many distinguished figures have spoken and debated uh, in this very chamber. Uh, Prime Ministers from Winston Churchill to Margaret Thatcher to Theresa May, American Presidents from Richard Nixon, Nixon Jimmy Carter, hashtag global treasure, wasn't he great? Um, <laughs> Reagan, Clinton, Mother Teresa, Malcolm X, the Dalai Lama, uh, Elton John, Michael Jackson, Barry White, uh, Ron Jeremy, who is a porn star apparently, Stormy Daniels, Stormy Daniels has not been here, I'm told. By the way, sorry, if anyone in the Oxford Union leadership is here today, I challenge you to invite Stormy Daniels. Um, <laughs> so, uh, who else? Uh, Stephen Hawking, Stephen Fry, Johnny Depp, Kermit the Frog, the list goes on. And adding to that uh, wonderful list will be uh, these six inspired leaders who are with us today, who I'll introduce in a moment. Uh, but first, lest you uh, believe that we may be introducing some bias here, debating the, the role of universities within university, be clear that the Oxford Union is not part of the University of Oxford. From its founding, it was founded and is run as an independent entity by design to protect intellectual freedom for students and junior members of the university to be able to speak their minds freely. So we are not within the university at this moment and we are not taking sides. Um, speaking of universities, that's what we're here to discuss today. Uh, I don't think anyone in this room uh, would argue that universities have obviously played an important role in our society and its development. Without universities, we wouldn't have computers or the internet. Uh, we wouldn't have antibiotics or the human genome project. We wouldn't have seatbelts or Toothpaste, imagine a world without toothpaste. However, especially in recent years, universities have come under a lot of criticism for being elite and out of touch, inaccessible. Of course, it's not a new phenomenon that universities have not always been for everybody. Even parts of this university until very recently excluded women and people of color. Uh, today, of course, there are still other more invisible barriers. Uh, but uh, in this time uh, uh, of great social challenges, there's a real question about what the purpose of the university is, who universities are for, and what role they play in our society. And that's what we're here to discuss today. And we're doing so uh, using the lens of proximity. Um, for those who are visiting today from the Skull Forum, you'll know that the theme for our conversations this week has been the power of proximity. And we've been using that lens and defining not just the physical dimensions of proximity, meaning physically close to one another, but also social and even moral dimensions of proximity. And so I think that we'll hear all of those kinds of elements here. Uh, and so, uh, so, so what's the, the positioning of universities relative to communities across across the road and across the world. I'd like to uh, introduce our motion, our proposition, and then I'll introduce our debaters. And I'll tell you a little bit about the Oxford uh, Union debate format, because this is a format in which many of you will also participate. Uh, so today we're going to be debating the motion, this house believes that universities lack the necessary proximity to be effective agents of social innovation in the 21st century. So we'll be debating for that proposition that universities lack the proximity and against uh, that, in fact, universities do have a role to play. Uh, so let me introduce our debaters and then we'll talk about the rules of the game. And I'm going to start by introducing the proposition team, which is arguing for the motion. Um, so first, we're so pleased to welcome uh, Bill Drayton here. I think many in this room know Bill Drayton. He's an iconic figure uh, and, and really a legend in the world of social entrepreneurship. Um, 
you know, if I listed his and others' biography here, we'd, our entire 90 minutes would be up. But let me be brief. Um, he founded Ashoka in 1980 and continues to lead it. Uh, it's an incredible organization that, um, uh, that works with over 4,000 um, uh, fellows and change makers across the globe uh, and, uh, and has really been a driving force in uh, not only developing the movement of social entrepreneurship, but then broadening that movement uh, in, in really de describing ways in which uh, we can all become change makers. And I think that's really the vision of the organization. Um, he has a long and distinguished history dating back to his education at Harvard, Yale, and here at Oxford with a master's from Balliol College uh, and is one uh, awards which are, as we say in medicine, TNC, TNTC, too numerous to count. Um, so welcome, Bill. Uh, and thank you. Uh, and second on the proposition team to Bill's right is Megan Fallone. Megan is the uh, CEO of Barefoot College. Um, she's an entrepreneur, a designer, and a passionate mountaineer and brings all these things together in the work of Barefoot College International. Uh, Megan's committed to empowering illiterate and semi-literate rural women across the developing world through mastery of technology, unlocking rural girls' creativity and confidence while leveraging human potential. Uh, embodied in poor rural communities. Um, in her current role, uh, the, the Barefoot College International has grown wildly, um, and after 45 years of, uh, of its work modeled on the life and work of Mahatma Gandhi, is now working in 91 or 92 countries around uh, the world in the global south. Um, uh, her work in Barefoot College is inspiring. Welcome, Megan. And third, closing for that team, will be Nicola Stoyer. Nicola is the managing director of the School for Social Entrepreneurs uh, here in the UK. Um, SSE is an organization that helps social entrepreneurs, intrapreneurs, and charity leaders learn how to transform their own communities and help people in need. Each year they train over 1,000 people in the UK, in Canada, and in India through a network of school partners. Um, and uh, Nicola joined SSE in 2015 after working for over 15 years in voluntary community and social enterprise sector. Um, as managing director, she works across this um, broad international network of SSE's affiliate uh, schools. Uh, welcome, Nicola. Thank you. And the opposition team uh, leading off is uh, Agnes Binaguajo. Uh, Agnes is a pediatrician and currently the Vice Chancellor of the University of Global Health Equity in Rwanda. Uh, she was trained in Belgium before returning to her native Rwanda shortly after the 1994 genocide um, to help and she never left. Um, uh, she worked there first as a pediatrician, then as the Director of the National AIDS Control Commission, then as Permanent Secretary, and then for six years as Minister of Health. And is really, as someone who knows Rwanda, deeply, I can say, has really been the architect of the, what's been called the healthcare miracle in, uh, in, in Rwanda, and, uh, and since last year has led uh, the new University of Global Health Equity. She also has awards and such, which are too numerous to count, but she's also an, a, a senior lecturer at Harvard Medical School, and I think at Dartmouth and some other places. She's terrific. Welcome, Agnes. Keith McGee, the Reverend Dr. Keith McGee is, I want to get your title right, Keith. Um, he's, a, he's a theologian, public intellectual, and a, and a social justice activist, um, currently serves as a senior fellow in culture and justice at University College London, uh, leading an initiative called Cultures Creating Compassionate Cities. This is a project, um, a, a community-led scheme and research initiative that aims to provide evidence and recommendations on how to build a culture of compassion through exploring belief into urban gentrification. Uh, Keith did his studies in theology at the Harvard Divinity School. He worked as a faith leader in Barack Obama's campaign. Uh, he has pastored two congregations uh, in Boston, including my own. Um, full disclosure, he married my wife and myself in 2011 uh, and is an old friend. He has many other wonderful gifts as well. Welcome, Keith.
And our final debater is Ben Nelson, who's the founder and CEO of the Minerva Project. Minerva is a really fascinating uh, new institution of higher education that's very disruptive and helps uh, students and young people to unlock their potential, not by learning lots of facts in a particular subject, but learning how to think and how to reason and how to communicate and really kind of upends uh, much of uh, uh, traditional, I think, pedagogical models. Uh, he, prior to founding Minerva, um, started and led for many years Snapfish, which grew to become the world's largest personal publishing service, meaning printing photographs and things like that. Uh, became a massive company, uh, five times bigger than any of its competition. Uh, and uh, so he's a, he's a distinguished and experienced entrepreneur and activist and really a visionary pedagogue as well. Welcome, Ben. Okay, so these are the ground rules. Uh, again, we're debating the motion, this house believes that universities lack the necessary proximity to be effective agents of social innovation in the 21st century. Um, we will be uh, beginning with Bill, uh, who will have, along with each other speaker, nine and a half minutes to state the case. Um, so, um, so the proposition will lead off, followed by the first speaker from the opposition. After that, we'll move to the second speaker in the proposition and the second speaker from the opposition to rebut. The next step after that is you, okay? So you guys will be both judges, but can also participate in the debate. So after the second speaker is finished, I'll invite voluntarily, I will not call on you, members of the audience who wish to make a point or actually contribute to the debate to come up here on the side of the proposition or the opposition. And you'll have, depending on our time, up to about two minutes to make your point, one minute or two. Um, so we'll hopefully get a couple of voices from the audience on each side as well. Following, uh, following points from the audience, we'll move on to our final debaters on each team to make the closing case, after which point you'll vote. Um, so that's how it works. Uh, we want to make this fun. Um, it's an exciting topic. It's a heavy topic, but, uh, uh, but we're all friends here, and so we really want to enjoy this. You as members of the audience are encouraged to, um, to show your love. If you hear something you really like, show your appreciation. You're welcome to hoot. You're welcome to stomp the floor um, and make some noise and, uh, and encourage, uh, encourage good ideas. Um, if there's something you really don't like, I suppose you could boo and hiss, but let's be respectful. Don't boo the person. Boo the idea. Um, but get involved. Get involved. Make it fun. Are we ready? Okay, excellent. Let me first introduce the secretary here, Julian Cotti, my colleague and the research and insights manager at the Skoll Center. He is in charge of keeping time and will ring the bell. Um, are you going to give a warning ring? Uh, I will uh, ring the bell once at eight minutes, uh, twice at nine minutes, and at 10 minutes, I'll keep on ringing the bell. Uh, <laughs> don't think I'm rude. It's just how it works. Okay, wonderful. Well, let's kick this off. And I uh, am really privileged to welcome our first speaker arguing for the proposition, Bill Drayton. Thank you. So we start off with some tradition. Honorable Chair. But I want to do an innovation. Instead of honorable guests, how about honorable colleagues? So we find that the universities lack the necessary proximity to do a decent job at innovation in this century. So let's start with an observation. What proportion of the Ashoka Fellows and Skoll awardees do you think come from the universities. It's a tiny, tiny percentage. And why do you think that is? This gets us into a very deep structural problem that's been getting worse and worse. The culture, the organizational arrangements, the systems, and increasing the self-selection of people who come, especially for faculty, and all those pieces are reinforcing one another, and they're driving the universities away from the capacity to contribute to innovation. So we're going to, in this first section, we're going to 
try to drive that central point home and, and make the point that it's getting worse, not better. And then in the next two sections, we'll dive much more deeply into the failure to deal with the grassroots and the failure to have the whole society in the universities. So let me begin with um, what innovation requires. What does an entrepreneur do? You have to understand what the world realistically is going to be like in the future because otherwise you're designing towards something that won't work. And you've got to listen all the time. There's a little squeak over here. You, oh, we've got to change things. Or it's a sweet spot over here. Well, then we, maybe we modify favorably. And you've got to deal with everybody, uh, including people you didn't think about to begin with. So let me, let me give you a concrete example. This is uh, Bright Simons, who's an Ashoka fellow from Ghana. And he saw a problem. Interpol did a survey of the pharmacies in Lagos and found that 80% of what they were selling were fakes. Oh, well, that has sort of a pretty big impact on health. So Bright said, how are we gonna solve this problem? He noticed people suddenly had cell phones. He said, oh, well, you know, if people could take a photo of the barcode on the bottle and there was a free phone call to the pharma company who could send a note back this is a fake or it's real, suddenly there's a blinding light that destroys this whole system of corruption. Well, it took him a couple of years to negotiate with the governments and the phone services and the pharma companies and miscellaneous others, but he did it. And it worked. And it spread across Africa, South Asia. This year it's going into Latin America. And he's expanded it to deal with auto parts you know, a fake auto part isn't really good for your health either. And now he's expanded it into seeds. Fake seeds do not help farmers. Now, ask yourself, how many university departments do you know who could do this? And the fact that it's such an unthinkable question or answer tells you something is structurally wrong. And it hasn't always been this way. So um, one of the alums that Balliol College is very proud of is Adam Smith, who taught there. And as you know, he sort of invented most of modern economics, and he was a philosopher and an ethicist. So he wasn't suffering from this disease. But now, where are we? So there's an iconic cartoon. I'm sure you've all seen it. There's the ocean, and there's a little desert island, and there's a palm tree. And leaning up against the palm tree is an economist. And next to him on the ground is a can of beans. And so the question is, how are you going to open the can of beans? And his answer, of course, is, assume a can opener. <laughs> well, we all understand immediately what that means because we know what the problem is. This whole field has gotten so disconnected from the reality and the ability to think about the complex interrelationships. Just compare that with Adam Smith and his writing. So um, it's very hard to disentangle this. So I, I've had a friend who was leader at Sussex University and another friend who was the master of a really good college here. And they both saw the problem and wanted to change it and had specific ideas and they both failed. Uh, one of the reasons they failed is that the accreditation agencies are organized by stovepipe. And you can't get an accreditation if you don't fit the stovepipes. Um, <coughs> think about the implications of this. It, gets, it just gets steadily worse. Um, so one of the other things that happens now is that there is a self-selection process. Who would want to spend their life in this sort of a system? So we get a narrower and narrower type of person signing up to be faculty members. And then that drives the system more in this direction. Um, so this is um, really quite concerning. Um, 
think what this means for students. How are the students supposed to find role models of people who are really good at doing what Bright Simon does in the university? How are these, where, where are you supposed to learn how all the pieces fit together and are changing? Um, there are very complicated skills required to be someone who's good at the game of change. You have to master cognitive empathy based living for the good of all. So the cerebral cortex and the neurons working together to understand this kaleidoscope of changing context. And you have to learn that and practice it, be good at it. You have to practice very sophisticated teamwork. And it's a totally different type of leadership. But look at what happens in university. The experience is so. You write your exam by yourself, you write your papers by yourself. Where do you get the teamwork? And how are you supposed to master these actually quite complicated skills? Um, this problem uh, gets worse uh, because it's operating against a backdrop. And, and this, is one, this is probably the most important fact about how the world is now working is that the rate of change and the degree and extent of interconnectedness is going up exponentially. And second fact, the demand for repetition, which is causally related, is going down exponentially. So you have a system that is getting into narrower and narrower, deeper and deeper stovepipes with thicker and thicker walls, unable to break out of that system, just as the world needs exactly the opposite. This is a train wreck. It's a really serious train wreck. And uh, so I'm, I'm really sorry, thank you, that you were here, but I, we thought that Fred Swanker was going to be here. And I thought, God, poor Fred. He has devoted his life to blowing up this system and coming up with a new way of doing university education and then breaking out entirely from that to provide what people really need. And how could he possibly have drawn the straw of defending the system? So you have my total sympathies. Thank you. <laughs> For the opposition. <clears throat> dear Chair and dear Honorable Guest, thank you for your sympathy, but I don't need it. <laughs> and I strongly argue against the resolution that university lack the necessary proximity to be effective agent of social innovation in the 21st century. And for many reasons, but I will develop only a few of them. First, more and more universities embrace pedagogy that engage students with communities where they live. My university is doing that. Really? Yes, clap, because we are revolutionary. Yes, we are doing that and really strongly. Our classroom opened the door and the class is entire country, Rwanda, the health sector. Not inside the wall. Maybe when it rains, but not so much. Second, universities offer and still offer convening space to bring together learners, experts from around the globe to reflect on the most pressing challenges, social challenges of this world. And university provide those individuals with the tools to generate research that will inform the ways to address those challenges. Many universities, therefore, are a good place to connect problems with people and to advance the knowledge on human conditions that help create and sustain 
more fair, tolerant, and just society, even in this great period of moral recession. <clears throat> Let me give you the example of my country, Rwanda. This country was totally destroyed 24 years ago. You know that. But this country recovered in an incredible way. It's not because it's my country. Just go. Use new technology, just Google it. And we have recovered because of social innovations. We have recovered despite the level of poverty of our country, the high level of illiteracy, and also the high number of people who were killing the killers during the genocide. And if we have recovered, it's because Institute of High Learning came and reached out to communities, and which communities in my country, they have developed tools to understand what were the major reasons of that genocide. They have communities at village level, at national level, to understand that, but even beyond national, globally, by studies we did with our communities, they may be illiterate, university can talk to them. And we understood even at the genocide, like the one in Armenia, like the one in Namibia, and many others, thanks to scholars. And doing so, those tools that were developed have helped Rwandan to understand the factors that have contributed to the genocide. But also, they have created social innovations that have brought structural change in communities, in the society, to make the society more inclusive, to make the society more just, to give community ownership by transfer knowledge, and also to revigorate our culture by studying our history that was stolen by the colonialists. And yeah, we did so. And now it's a peaceful country, a bright light in Africa and in the world, thanks to the contribution of universities. Never undermined that. And it's this approach that we are using in the University of Global Equity. <laughs> we are using it, and our students are taught in a rural north of Rwanda, a remote area, and we focus their education on providing in Rwanda and elsewhere how to give quality health services to rural poor. Don't forget that the majority of human beings live in rural poor, isn't it? We educate them to go and help and change and equip them to be innovators. Different way because different culture need different approach. And with new tools of implementation science, we produce innovation. We teach them to be lifelong learners and innovators. But we also make sure that with the approach of academic-based community services, our students get, think, uh, get to think uh, critically and understand the problem faced by the community where they live, because they are in, they are members of this community, they are working with the community, and they are working for that community, and all community services are embedded in the curricula. Doctors, nurses, and pharmacists that need to learn to be pharmacists before selling fake or non-fake drugs. This is a tool. Hmm? And also, this approach makes our students reflect on problems 
And thanks to living in communities, they connect with local leaders, with community leaders, with business leaders, health professional leaders, and together they learn how to change the society, how to be leaders using that wide network of researchers, scholars, and community leaders, business leaders. So, using strategic thinking approach and evidence base generated by research, alongside community leaders and all those other leaders that are connected with, they learn how to work together, to bring consensus, to be agent of change, and also to articulate and be capable to advocate for the innovation they will bring. Because it's not enough to bring innovation. You need to bring social changes. Okay, so <laughs> the other thing is the proximity with the internet. More than millions, the hundred millions of people are educated today thanks to the spread of internet with e-learning. And also with fragmented curricula, they just pick what they need to solve a solution. With all the network we have, I just come from the US with Flexner, we have the community of global health uh, scholars and uh, students that are all linked with their community. Do you know more proximity than that? What I want to say to conclude, Mr. Chair, is that the world is ongoing transformation. That's true. But university doesn't lack proximity. Those who lack proximity is because it's a failure of implementation of the proximity that we have. Not because they lack proximity. And they are still agent of change. I am the proof of that with my country. Thank you. Second speaker for the proposition. Thank you, Mr. Chair, honorable guest to the Oxford Union. In his book, Future Shock, Alvin Toffler writes, the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write. It will be those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. This idea bases itself that perhaps the premise of the handicap of the 21st century will actually be a lack of proximity to a truly fluid learning process, cautioning us that to remain entrenched in institutions that prize literacy above experiential learning will risk to fail ourselves and the challenges before us in this century. I would argue that the thread, this thread of thought relates directly to the question at hand whether or not an institution whose perceived success is somehow tied to the number of static facts that the people who attend it are able to accumulate, memorize, and in turn regurgitate, has anything near the responsive thought process that allows it to truly be an innovator, let alone a social innovation organization. We all know that universities are not by nature risk takers nor is their tolerance for deviance what it was in the 1960s or 70s. In fact, they become largely politically correct in nature. After all, it is hard to hold accountable and even harder to evaluate the performance of someone who's truly thinking out of the box. Yet for any innovative and entrepreneurial approaches to be developed, the component of risk must be present. More than present, it must be prevalent. I have hundreds of young people who come to work with me every year at Barefoot College, many of whom come from the finest educational institutions around the world. They all think they're experts, and they're expert until they're standing in front of a rural poor community with human beings who live on less than $2 a day. And they must establish a relationship with those human beings that has nothing to do with the grades they got, the papers they wrote, the academic accolades. It has to do with the substance of knowing who they are and how they will speak to another human being. <laughs> to stand before a community takes courage. 
To stand before a human being in a worse situation than you takes bravery, compassion, humility. And this we do not learn in a classroom. In fact, I don't remember taking Humility 101 at any of the universities I went to. I learned humility living beside 200 rural grassroots, incredibly innovative and resourceful human beings who teach me every single day what I do not know. A fluidity of thought that leads to a fluidity of action is the single most important element in being truly adaptive to the conditions, hurdles, barriers, and obstacles that all social innovators must and do face. Universities today within social innovation programs far too often focus on market-based solutions and impact metrics and plans. Social innovation departments are too often housed within business schools and not in colleges of the humanities. <laughs> Indeed, the very skills we need in order to succeed require an engagement with messiness, with the messiness of human beings, the unpredictability, the unaccountability of human beings. It cannot be crunched into a syllabus. It cannot be measured in an incremental way. We don't get tested on our interpersonal skills at university. The esteemed Pamela Hardigan, former director of the Skoll Center for Social Entrepreneurship wrote, whatever day it is in the world, something has changed. Figure out what it is and what it means. Forget what you just did and what you just learned. Start fresh every day. To be effective, one must be a, in con a continual student of everything we do, able to wake from one day to the next, set aside all the facts that we might have accumulated because they are no longer relevant to a particular situation. Nothing could be further than what we're taught at university. We must assimilate geographic, environmental, political, cultural, economic security, and a host of other conditions that bear on any social challenge or situation of inequality. We must be able to absorb a level of complexity that can only be answered by a highly developed intuition, I would argue. The very term social innovation implies a critical element, a deeply rooted propensity towards entrepreneurial behavior, a continual redefinition and reevaluation of a specific ecosystem, in short, being constantly that ever-present student. Genuine innovators, entrepreneurs, social and otherwise, are so often characterized by words such as passion, perseverance, values, empathy, hard work, and of course, creativity. Einstein said, imagination is far more important than knowledge. And I'm not sure that our universities do anywhere near an adequate job of fostering and developing imagination. It is the skills of unlearning and relearning at an almost exponential speed, which are exactly what we will all have to master if we are to keep pace with the coming trajectory of innovation and its impact in our lives. The exponential nature of the velocity of change that will happen in the next 100 years in comparison to what has happened in the previous 100 years is something none of us can even yet comprehend. When we entertain this thought, we think of things like artificial intelligence or self-driving cars, but imagine the same velocity is happening in all the negative things. Climate change, food security, water security, conflict. More specifically, the velocity of innovation within the developing world and often within the most resource poor or challenged communities themselves must be seen, recognized, respected, and built upon for genuine solutions to actually evolve that will stay. It would be the height of arrogance to imagine that anyone could grasp from a classroom at a university at distance the speed with which innovation happens when people's survival is at stake. When they tire of the barriers that block them from reaching their aspirations, universities are simply not structured to mirror that velocity of innovation that is born of urgent and immediate need and survival in real time 
nor to be able to support it or grasp it effectively from afar. This kind of responsiveness is a rigor unto itself, a discipline that refuses to allow a stagnation of thought, entrenched viewpoints, and a set of fixed information points to limit it. I put before you that universities, as they are currently structured and indeed set up as business models in many cases, operate largely today as corporations with their own priorities, often conflicting ones, institutional biases, a certain arrogance that are simply unable to teach in a distilled setting the kinds of skills essential for them or their students to be credible or effective agents of social innovation. In looking at even broader systems change, which will require a far grander and more complex level of collaboration, universities who work within silos are largely unable to teach a set of a, or set an example of the disciplines that help us to remove power dynamics and personal ownership for solutions to truly reach collaborative solutions. Systemic change approaches and the humility to engage in them implies a potential of losing your unique identity and universities prize and reward the connection between individ an individual and his or her unique idea. If we honestly use the lens of the past to look at what have been the catalysts to the most disruptive shifts and jolts from one status quo to the next, they are not universities or even the institutions that were built upon the formulation of ideas separate from action, nor from critical thought or expertise. They were individuals. They were human beings whose proximity above all to those in whom they lost themselves and served, who have driven the largest movements of real social innovation. Uh, before our second speaker for the opposition starts, I just want to remind you that following our next speaker, uh, we're going to be counting on you to join into the debate. So we'd like to hear uh, voices uh, for both sides of the motion. Um, so please be ready to participate and don't be shy. Um, secondly, I just want to say that I'm really enjoying sitting up here in this really tall <laughs> throne-like chair. I could get used to this. Okay. Sorry, to Keith. Dear Chair and to our honorable guests, I have the privilege of taking you from Judy Garland's Wizard of Oz to Diana Ross's The Wiz. As we consider the proposition surrounding the larger theme of the power of proximity, underscoring here the need for social innovation from the ground up, I'd like to draw your attention to two things. First, the historic parallels between America and British lived experiences, and then to show you how universities have become significant in building a culture of compassion towards this ideal of only being long-held beacons of intellectual inquiry and knowledge generating. And rather than just being ivory towers that have become iron cages, I'd like to assert how they actually defined a culture of compassion. I'd like to explore culture in the terms of both the tangible and intangible heritage, and both the built and the lived environment. The parallel Historic parallels exist in American and British lived experiences. Both deal with this rapid industrialization, population movement and change, immigration and migration, and the rise of working and middle class people. It also deals with slum clearances and the demands and the design for large scale public and social housing along with the collapse of industries and the shifting of work patterns to service-based and unskilled labor. 
both have experienced the decay of the built environment and the effects of disadvantaged minorities defining such places in America as Milwaukee and the UK as Manchester. In America such as Baltimore and here in the UK such as Birmingham or Chicago opposed to Sheffield. Of course, challenges of post of urban post uh, industrialization has affected countries all around the world. But it is clear that many of the characteristics of cities of the American Rust Belt are mirrored to the experiences of the British Midlands and the north of England. The urban environment, for example, is a phenomenal particular to the US, the suburban environment, excuse me, is particular to the US and to the UK, as are many of the shared ethnic and social divisions in both countries' urban communities. In the midst of these challenges, however, the roles of universities are and remain critical to the distri distribution of education that therefore creates the distribution of wealth and housing and is a part of the rebuilding of the decayed environment and it mobilizes through creative roles of galvanizing community action, cultural organizations, and social innovation in creating these shared senses of identity. identity. In the 1980s, policymakers talked of the terms of creative cities. By connecting culture to questions of community and social justice, and by connecting the question of civil society to culture. Universities then have come to the helm to provide angles and evidence of ways to access knowledge and relationship between the well-being of citizens and a culture. They have come to the place of understanding how to create common good and that common good being understood through compassion. In the terms of creative creativity, universities have drawn on academic debates that have taken shape for decades, centered around the notion of creativity in creative cities is the theorist Charles Landry who describes this ideal of a creative city in terms of cultural resources. Landry as cultural resources were seen in the 80s as raw materials uh, and its value uh, based on replacing coal and steel and gold. Creativity then is the method of exploiting the resources and helping them to grow. Universities are now expanding the ideal of raw material. It is now being expanded to include forms of intellectual stimulation that extends beyond the classroom into the community. Universities are now using raw materials such as electronics to train not only in the classroom, but to sit at home and learn through an electronic device abroad in many different countries. They're using technology for innovation to expand the reach far beyond the norms thinking, experiencing, and exposing one another to different culture. To be able to take, a class, to take a class sitting in London but having a professor in Japan is expanding culture. To think then around creative cities is to think around organization. Universities have taken on the demand of new ways of looking at the built environment in terms of individuals and communities beyond infrastructure. At the heart of the idea is that which is far from something that is static or entrenched is this notion of place. Universities have challenged with creativity the ideal of place. You can now be any place and receive your education. 
The culture then of creativity is the catalyst thereby of mobilizing ideas and taking talent from inside the classroom, outside the classroom to inform culture. Understanding that culture is not just creativity, it is not art, it is not Van Gogh, it is not Beethoven, it is not the refugees, it is not a mural in an inner city, but culture is what defines economy and society, and universities are doing that work. Culture then becomes a part of all of us, and universities are now allowing us to expose that to one another, not by your roommate from another country, but by experiencing it through technology. Culture, it defines both the person and the place, and it is now a part of how we think, we feel, and we educate. It shapes our identity. Culture is the key component, but far beyond that is the culture of compassion. Compassion being, as the Charter of Compassion says, this indispensable opportunity for creativity, for a just society, and to bring about global peace. It is by a blending of creativity and culture and compassion that universities become agents of social change and innovation. There are comparative studies of New York and London looking at what London's UCL East project is doing to build a wider culture of compassion with creating larger scale communities that are developed with community engagement as opposed to just being developed by developers. As also in New York, what Columbia University has done to transform urban gentrification into Harlem with economic and societal changes. So I suggest to you today that universities have taken on an identity of culture that is both about the built and lived experience and about exposing both the tangible and the intangible heritage that we all share. Thank you. Time for members of the audience. Uh, do we have, uh, amongst our distinguished guests here, those who would like to argue in favor of the proposition? Mohammed, please come to the front. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to make three or four quick points in my one minute. Firstly, it was George Bernard Shaw, I believe, who said that those can go out and do it, they will go and do it, and those that can't will teach. The second point uh, I would make um, is that um, when you look at the difference or the tension between proximity and competition, this is something which is very important. University basically uh, is a very competitive environment. And within that, proximity, I think, takes uh, second place. So unless you alter the culture and you alter competition, it'll be very hard to be both proximate and competitive. Thirdly, and most importantly, I think, success at universities is defined by rankings. Rankings are all about what people get as salaries when they leave universities. And unless you start to recognize a system where social innovation is given as prominent a ranking as is pure financial salary, I think the culture will not change. And finally, <laughs> and finally, look at Oxford University itself. It took Oxford until 2017 to come up with a long-dated bond in which to borrow money. So they borrowed money for a hundred year, on a 100-year bond at 2.5%. So for somebody that prides itself in innovation, they should have been able to do this 100 years ago, not last year. Thank you very much. Another speaker for the proposition in the back. Mr. Chair, fellow backbenchers, members of the audience, 
Our illustrious speakers have come up with some wonderful arguments, but I contend that the proposition is incorrect. It should read that <clears throat> it's the failure of proximity of the high-income countries with low-income communities. I contend I've seen sitting on committees with international task forces, and in fact, the higher up the ladder, academic ladder one is, the more obstructive one is to the proximity. It is not unusual in the settings I've been for people at have a very high academic level and people in the community. And the people in the high activity, a high academic community actually provide arguments against the possibility of doing something good. So I contend and I would recommend that a, every member of a faculty be required to spend six months every few years, their sabbaticals in a low-income community. And every student should be required to spend time in a low-income area. <laughs> if we do not do that, then the proposition as it stands will be absolutely correct. Uh, volunteers to argue for the opposition. So I want to make a couple points. First, um, this idea that innovation is something that just arises out of the blue without any history, I think, is wrong. Universities are instrumental in creating a history of knowledge from which innovation is built year after year. And thus, without this knowledge bank, the innovations we see today from social entrepreneurs would not exist. More importantly, I think it's really important the research that is done at universities that contributes to this knowledge bank, which is oftentimes, especially at public universities, of which I have attended, um, is critical because it's then a public good as opposed to research that's done solely at organizations or companies that is then only used for private profit. Uh, the second point I would like to make um, is that I totally second this idea that students should spend time in, uh, with low-income communities. That is actually what happened with me at my undergrad at UC Berkeley, where I was part of the Global Poverty and Practice minor, um, which required every student to spend a minimum of six weeks up to six months uh, working in low-income communities, and I think that this is critical to why I am now here today working for the Skoll Foundation. I was also a part of a program at UC Davis that was where I ran a program that put STEM students uh, into low-income communities so that they could apply the research that they were doing as masters and graduate students to the needs of those local communities. So I think this idea that Universities are stagnant places that don't have proximity is wrong, and they're critical in providing this uh, value chain of innovation. For the opposition, yeah, please. This will be our final guest speaker. So, as a professor of a university that teaches social entrepreneurship, I would like to say <laughs> that when you talk about universities lacking proximity, I think that you confuse the buildings, as beautiful as they can be, with being a professor and the relationship that a professor has with his students and the value that an idea can have as the inception of something that is going to happen in the future. You talk, about, you talk about messiness, and I can tell you, what is more messy than a student? <laughs> with, with the dreams, with the aspirations, 
and with the fears of what's to come. And the idea of a university bringing value there for them to see a better future and to dream and inspire with a different world and not only with a better income. That's the value of university. And Mr. Drayton, as I uh, value so much, I would say when you asked how many uh, awardees and how many uh, uh, Ashoka Fellows come from universities, I would ask how many of them began their journey in a classroom, began their journey with the idea of a professor there. And then we can say, what is the value of university? Because at the end, I think the university is a network of people thinking for a better future. And that, for me, is a great example of proximity. Thank you. Uh, and now we begin closing arguments and welcome our final speaker for the proposition. Thank you, Chair. I want to begin by telling you about a man called Junior. A junior dropped out of school when he was 14. Uh, he, his life wasn't exactly privileged. Uh, drugs, gang-related crime surrounded Junior. So soon enough, Junior was convicted for a drug-related offence. He was sentenced to 12 years in prison. Junior describes prison as a place of paranoia and fear, and also a place where you could touch the toilet bowl from your bed. While in prison, Junior started noticing a problem. The same men were coming in and out of the prison doors. They'd be released, then they'd return again. Sometimes the same men coming back to share the exact same cell that Junior was in. Then something happened. One day Junior picked up a book and included within that book was the quote from Mahatma Gandhi, you must be the change you wish to see in the world. Now this quote unlocked something for Junior, as I'm sure it probably has for one or two of you in this room today. And he resolved that when he got out of prison, he was going to do something to break the cycle of reoffending. And we met Junior when he applied and was successfully recruited onto one of the School for Social Entrepreneurs startup programmes. Now today, Junior runs the SOS project. It's an award-winning service to break the cycle of reoffending, working with more than 600 young people in London each year, and particularly like focusing on those at risk of gang involvement, child exploitation, and violence. Now SOS has reduced reoffending rates among its young people from 75% to just 12%. Junior has achieved this through social innovation. He's reshaped the nature of the service and the nature of the agencies and the partnerships involved in delivering it. But crucially, Junior also recognised that his own life experiences are of huge value to the young people that he's seeking to serve. The SOS team are, as you'd imagine, all professionally trained individuals. But they also all come from similar backgrounds to the young people that they're working with. It's their very proximity to the issues they're addressing that gives them the understanding that they need to create effective change. And SOS has won, 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 won many awards for this approach. So this idea of proximity matters. The framing of the Skull World Forum theme on the power of proximity, as I'm sure you'll know, asserts that in order to address inequality and injustice, we must deeply understand the current status quo and how to disrupt it. And it goes on to state, there is no other way to do this than to engage with and be close to the people and communities fa facing deep and persistent biases of all kinds. So let's consider the evidence when it comes to universities. So if it's true that universities do have the necessary proximity to be effective agents of social innovation, we would expect to see universities demonstrate this at entry point at student recruitment stage, but they don't. In the main, universities continue to present barriers to entry and reflect a relative lack of diversity across a whole host of measures. Educational background, income background, ethnic background, I could go on. Furthermore, 
if universities are demonstrating the necessary, necessary proximity to be effective agents of social innovation, we would expect to see universities place value on the lived experience of those closest to the social problems they are seeking to create innovative solutions for. But we don't see this either. Merit in universities is still heavily related to academic prowess. This is not overly surprising if you think about the nature of the learning approach in a university. They have to take on people who are an approximate high academic standard to begin with and progress them to an even higher academic achievement. But what this means in practice is that social innovators with the closest connection and the deepest understanding of inequality or injustice that they are seeking to address do not get through the university gates. So let's just think back to Junior for a minute. So would Junior have got into any university programmes that could have helped him along the way? Well, being a Londoner, maybe he could have tried the London School of Economics Masters in Social Innovation and Entrepreneurship. But that probably wouldn't work because he'd have needed an undergraduate degree at 2-1 level and when you drop out of school at age 14, that's not really up for grabs. The £27,000 price tag might also have been a bit much because he'd not been earning for a fair few years. Maybe he could try Goldsmiths uh, University's Masters in Social Entrepreneurship. They want you to have 2 one two, but they might also consider any relevant experience. Well, he had some quite good life experience, but probably wouldn't classify for the professional experience needed for Goldsmith's entry. And he would have had the same problems trying to access many other university environments. Now, this is very different to how social innovation is advanced in other settings, where proximity sits at the core of the approach. For example, among the thousand or so people supported by the School for Social Entrepreneurs across our global network each year, at least one in four has direct experience of the social issues that they're seeking to address. So our students will be living in poverty, roughly about one in 10. They'll be living with a disability, roughly about one in 20. About one in 50 will be formerly homeless. One in 50 will be a recovering addict, whether it be drugs, alcohol, gambling, or, or otherwise. One in four of our students from black, Asian, or minority ethnic backgrounds. There are no academic requirements to access learning programmes at the SSE. And wherever possible, fees are covered by those other than the students to themselves to ensure that cost doesn't act as a barrier to entry. Now, learning at an institution like SSE means that someone with no educational qualifications will be sitting right alongside someone like Asha, who's a PhD in psychology, and who set up Innovating Minds, which is about providing psychological support in schools and in businesses in London and the Midlands. And it's this diverse connections between people that is what stimulates learning, stimulates development and stimulates innovation. But as we have already ascertained, a lack of diversity in university intakes means that the scope for this kind of diverse connection this, the conditions from which this innovation can arise, this exchange of experience and knowledge from people's diverse backgrounds and experiences is just wiped out before it even gets going. So what about the way in which learning takes place at university? We've heard a little bit about this already. So perhaps universities can foster effective social innovation by routinely connecting their students to their local communities or by fostering experiential learning outside of the lecture theatre. Now, in the UK, um, the Quality Assurance Agency, in their updated guidance for UK higher education institutions on enterprise and entrepreneurship education, which I think was released January of this year, um, make a distinction between different types of learning for entrepreneurship. So firstly, learning about, which is essentially about knowledge acquisition, learning about theories, learning about successful business models, etc., etc. Secondly, it's about learning for. Um, this is a more practical goal. This is about preparing people for action, perhaps thinking about entrepreneurial skills or how you innovate, how you bring about social change, but not actually doing it. And the third one is about learning through. So this is about the practical application of an entrepreneurial activity, such as startups, incubators, accelerators. So three distinctions. It doesn't take much of a look at the courses currently available to know that the vast majority of the university system is about learning about with a little bit of learning for thrown in for good measure. Yet two decades of, of practice at the School for Social Entrepreneurs shows us that it's the third component, learning through, 
practical application, which is crucial for innovators and entrepreneurs. Maybe learning, as we heard from the floor earlier, begins in the classroom, but for entrepreneurs and for social innovation, it certainly doesn't and cannot end there. But before I draw to a close, let me be clear. So universities do do vital work. I've graduated from a couple myself. I've worked within the university sector. There's all sorts of great things that are, are important and we need the university for. And yes, there are some outliers. We've heard from a few today. But these are not mainstream. Examples of universities working in this way are the exception, not the rule. Engagement with people and communities in any meaningful sense remains peripheral. Universities exclude far too many people with direct experience of social inequalities, and they've yet to find a systematic way to connect them to the people facing the greatest injustices in society. As a result, this House believes that such proximity is essential to a social innovation, and therefore, this House believes that universities lack the necessary proximity to be effective agents of social innovation in the 21st century. Dear Chair, dear honourable guests, first and foremost, let me thank uh, the side that was ostensibly arguing for the proposition and admitting that indeed the proposition cannot be voted for. <laughs> um, let's reiterate what the proposition says. This House believes, and accordingly this side, that universities lack the necessary proximity to be effective agents of social innovation in the 21st century. Effective agents does not mean that universities will solve all of our problems. It doesn't mean that all solutions must come from universities. It simply means that universities will be effective at catalyzing improvements to the world. By definition, this is true. And it is also true that there are many examples and anecdotes, some of which were shared by our opposing side, of things that universities do quite badly. Let me add some fuel to their fire. <laughs> Just because I want to give them a little bit of hand. 50% of peer-reviewed published social science research is not replicable, which basically means that it's wrong. Universities are constantly looking at things that are narrower and narrower as our opposing side have said, oftentimes leading to no real solutions at all. Oftentimes, universities come up with ideas that they accept as fact, only to be proven later to be not true. But who does that corrective action? Who figures out that scientific research falls short? Who takes the ideas that are generated in one part of a university and combines them with others to lead to further research? Universities do. We cannot confuse the shortcomings, and there are many, of institutions of higher education with the vital work that they do. Most importantly, we cannot assume that the university to which we are proximate now is a prototypical university. In very fact, it is not. If you look at the United States, <laughs> those universities that have an acceptance rate of under 50% of their applicants comprise only 20% of students who attend universities. More than half of American university students live at home and commute to school. When you look at that percentage, that proportion, globally, it is the vast majority of university goers that are living in their community and getting university education. And it is true. Universities will not educate everyone. They're not there to be compulsory 
But the vast majority of people who need to solve the world pro world's problems need to have proximity, but they need to have something else. Systemic thinking. Proximity is not enough to solve all of our problems. It is necessary, but it is not sufficient. Proximity enables us to contextualize the systemic thinking that we must learn. And let me repeat that piece. Because systemic thinking does not happen by accident. It doesn't happen universally. And it doesn't happen because of context. If it were to happen because of context, there would be no problems. We are all proximate to problems. We would be able to solve them all. <laughs> by definition, you cannot look at a man lying on the floor, throw a leech on his arm and say, huh, that didn't work, no medicine for you. <laughs> Education must be systemic. And the only way to provide systemic education is through institutions of higher education. Now, it does mean that universities have to reform. They do have to change. For example, teamwork, which was mentioned by the side, is crucial. And I went to an old university, not quite as old as this, with the one that is proximate to us, but I remember beginning in my freshman year, I did team projects in every single semester, not in every class, but they existed. We at Minerva actually teach our students humility and confidence, by the way. Two of the 100 components, the Habits of Mind foundational concepts that we teach them in order to solve the world's problems. We ensure that despite the fact that Minerva is a residential university, it is proximate. Students come from all over the world. For us, 85% of our students can afford the very low tuition and fees that we charge because they do come from socioeconomically diverse backgrounds. And they live in the world itself. They live in seven different countries by the time they grow up, including in highly developing economies. And so in short, outside of the technicalities and the fact that this side has forfeited their position, which we appreciate, <laughs> I say that you must vote against this resolution not because of its language, not because it is indeed the wrong resolution to have debated, not because it is all too easy to confuse Oxford and Cambridge and the Ivy League as representatives of universities when they are not. No, no, no. But because it is crucial that we support the enterprise of higher education that we support the need for systemic thinking, and that we all say clearly that without it, proximity won't solve all of our problems all on its own. Thank you. Is that fun? All right, let's, let's give our debaters another round of applause. <laughs> I feel like a flamenco dancer. Um, okay, it's time to vote. So uh, let's, let's vote with our feet. All those in favor of the proposition, please stand up and say aye. Excellent. We're not very scientific here. Thank you. Uh, all those in favor of the opposition against the motion, please stand up and say nay. Nay! <laughs> Looks like the nays have it. The motion <laughs> is rejected. Um, this, was, this was so much fun. I think one of the reasons I really love these debates is because this is 
something that I think is missing in the world at the moment, getting people with different views of the world and different viewpoints close together into the same room to talk it out and find a way forward. This is part of the power of proximity. Um, and so I'm so grateful to all of you for coming and, and, and being a part of this and particularly to our speakers. Uh, I want to thank our secretary who did a fine job. Chris Julian. He can read a clock and ding a bell. The, ma <laughs> the master of the bell. That's right. <laughs> Um, I want to just recognize members of the Skoll Center team and the Skoll Foundation team who are here, many of whom worked hard behind the scenes to make not only this event work, but everything else. Just please stand up for a second. Skoll Center, Skoll Foundation, come on. Come on, come on. Uh, and this is part of all of our collective efforts to bring this extraordinary week out to the rest of the community here and into the world. So thanks for participating. And, uh, and then one final time before we close, just please give a final round of applause to our six wonderful debaters today.